I definitely use music to like boost confidence for myself when I'm not Mm. feeling it. There is a song on Beyonce's Homecoming Live record. It's called I've Been On. And she's essentially just saying over and over again, like, I've been on, I've been on, tell me who's gonna take me off. And I I like, like in the mirror, like I kind of just like bulk myself (laughs) up. Can I tell you mine? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. New Level by ASAP Ferg. I'm on a new level. Yeah. (laughs) And I'm like, Fist pumping? Yeah, you got exactly. Yeah. You can't not do that. That's, That's what you have to do when the song comes on. You know, they say women shouldn't be bossy. We're out here reclaiming that word. What's so wrong with being the boss? I'm Tara Reed, the CEO of a multi million dollar ed tech business. And I'm Katie Gaddy Tossan, better known as Money with Katie on the internet. At our core, we're driven by a shared ambition to build our own mini empires. Welcome to Bossy. The idea that if you're not growing, you're dying is like 90% bullshit and like 10% true. If you're not growing, you're dying. <sighs> okay, say more about that. Well, I think it's it can be hard to recognize when you're in a slump. I think it's something you just kind of you feel or you don't. But I do think that there is this constant pressure for the line to be going up and to the right. Yeah, like people think that if the business is not continuously growing, then like something's got to be yeah, wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Do you I think, think it's more nuanced. Yeah, it's more nuanced. But I think it brings up a good conversation about just like handling the slump overall because your business is not going to be up into the right. Your life is not up into the right all the mm-hmm. time, let alone business. And so how do you handle the slump? That's, that's a good conversation topic my favorite example of this comes from a guy named nathan barry and actually yeah there's a lot of entrepreneurs in the audience who probably might not know him by name but actually use his product he built a newsletter platform called convert kit and i was talking to him a couple months ago he told me that his business originally stalled out at two thousand dollars per month in monthly reoccurring revenue while he was going for his goal His goal at the time was 5K per month, right? (laughs) He was like, oh my gosh, I really want to hit 5K per month, but I can't get past two. So he's in a bit of a a slump for about a year. And then another founder is talking to him and he's like, bro, like shit or get off the pot. Like take this thing seriously or move on. Mm. Kind of insinuating like 5K a month is not taken this seriously. Like you're thinking for a bigger goal. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it inspired him to make a big bet. So this is where it's the it's the decision in the slump that's a little bit of a pivot. I'm going to take a big bet. I'm going to change my approach. He invests 50k of his own money into hiring more help and he invested in a direct sales team. Mm. So we've talked about this before. You're hiring people that directly drive revenue. Yes. Within this is so crazy. Within two years, okay. Remember, he was at stuck at two k a month. Within two years, they're doing six million a year. Dang. So from two k a month. Yeah, and being yeah. like, God, I can't get to five k. And then someone was like, Dude. So he like made that pivot. That yep. that really big ballsy decision right from whatever marketing strategy he was doing before to like investing in sales team marketing team to really grow in a different way yeah it's not pivoting the product but like the approach and also the goals yes exactly that's a good distinction he wasn't he didn't pivot his product he pivoted his business strategy around the product Mm -hmm. and said i need to make a big bet on this so he said the network effects kicked in around 15k per month where customers were then telling other customers about the product and word of mouth started to be a piece of it too but like he needed the sales team to get him to the point that network effects could could take hold because i imagine what he was doing before was a little bit more organic Mm -hmm. right and then pivoted to direct sales direct sales is we're gonna pick up the phone Maybe do something that's not scalable, but like have a phone call with you to sell in whatever the product is and do something intentionally not scalable for a period of time. And then the sort of organic piece of it, the network marketing effects kick back in after that. But there's almost like this arc of like organic, maybe can get you a little bit and then really pushing forward on like more of a direct approach so that more of the organic can continue to spin. Right. And I think that's the that's the hard part is knowing 
Sometimes the answer is just enduring longer. You just have to stay the course and good yeah. things are going to happen. Yeah. There are other times where you are on a slow march to nowhere. Yeah. So do you have any examples of that that come to mind for you? Yeah. So my first business was an art startup. We had mm -hmm. this art matchmaking algorithm that like pulled artwork from the Internet and helped you find artwork and match your artwork based on your taste. And I had been building that with a totally different vision than the company that I have now. And there was a transition period where I pivoted from running Collecto for full time to running Apps Without Code full time. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like an overnight switch. But really what happened was like Collecto was stagnating a little bit. I think more than anything, my goals felt out of alignment because mm -hmm. I had heard all of this stuff about what you're supposed to do with like raising money and taking the VC track and like going to these accelerators and so I just kind of fell into that I went to a tech accelerator went, went through 500 startups and we had investors with not a lot but like angel investors and also 500 startups as investors and during my experience at 500 startups I realized in that accelerator like oh this is not really the path that hmm. I want to be on in terms of like growth at all costs kind of business structure but the challenge is like when you take on investors they have sort of that expectation. And I was lucky to have like friendly, nice investors. But at the same time, after that code started taking off because I was blogging about my experience right, building right. Collecto's app without coding and people kept messaging me saying, hey, can you show me how to make my own app? Like, yeah, Collecto's cool, but like show me how to make my own thing. <laughs> and I moonlighted for a long time. So I was working on one business during the day and like in the evening and on the weekends working on apps without code. And then I like mustered up the courage to go into pivot time because it was clearly time to switch. I remember for Apps Without Code, we had like one month where I made 70K in that month. And I was like, okay, there's something this with way more is. momentum mm -hmm. here. I need to follow that. And I had to call the angel investors that we had and say, hey, I'm shutting this down. I'm pivoting. I'm moving to a new thing. I offered them all the ability to invest in what I was going to do next. And it just wasn't like if you invest in art or creativity or something like that it just wasn't in their thesis and they passed and I moved on. Was there any pride or self-worth tied up in that change? Hell yeah. I didn't. I said it didn't happen fast because I was struggling mm -hmm. with it. Mm -hmm. It was a slow burn transition because, first of all, I was like, everybody's going to know I failed. Yep. <laughs> everybody's oh going to know I failed. In reality, like, no one no saw one it that way. No one, cared. no one cares. No one's even looking at you no. that close. People are way too worried about themselves. They're worried about themselves. They're not trying to see if you failed or not. They're trying to see if they failed or not. So, like, no one really cared or stressed about it. In fact, any if anything, they were like, oh, this new new business idea is cool. Yeah. Oh, she's on her second business. She's, How interesting. Oh, yeah. She's, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Serial entrepreneur. Yeah. Two-time founder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. See, there's <laughs> always that spin you can put on it. It's yeah. Like, oh, no, I didn't fail. And I think I learned, too, that, like, in a pivot af after that, I learned that it's useful to just, like, think about both sides of the narrative. Right. There is a doom and gloom narrative of like, oh, I failed. There's also another one. And it kind of gave me some courage to think about the other one. Hmm. Right. The more positive one. Some of the things that you just mentioned. I like that. So, yeah. So, like, I made a whole business pivot, not even like an inside of one business from one strategy to another, but like pivoted from one business to a whole nother. I like that. Have you had any sort of like big pivot changes or small pivot changes yeah 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 i think um especially when i look back on the on this broader concept of enduring through something versus deciding that something's not working and you need to make, take more decisive action i think in the beginning of building money with katie i had this promise that i made to myself that i was going to blog twice a week for a year Oh, that was like, I need to just, it's the beginning of the year. You That's have whole... to get the momentum going. So I was like, I need a defined period of time that I'm going to give myself to see if this works. And so it was 12 months of time, twice a week. And by the time the 12 months was up, things were going great and it was monetized and everything was fine. But like, it gave me that kind of that framework. Right. And so in that sense, it's like, Enduring is like all there is to do. You're not going to pivot because what are you pivoting mm. from? You don't even know if the first thing you did is working yet. So Got I think it. that was like the, the enduring moment. Got it. So in my example, I'm sort of talking about 
moving because part of part of enduring is pivoting when you need to and part of enduring is just staying on exactly what you were doing before in your example you're sort of saying like you stayed with what you were doing before before you stuck with the consistency uh-huh. but then there have been other times recently where like things were not working like we had yeah. our foray into courses i think has been a little bit lackluster our yeah. youtube presence was like not really working in the way we wanted it to so in both of those cases we said you know what shelve it we're going to come back to that later it's not the most important thing right now we don't have the momentum there we need to make a pivot there so Mm. in the meantime we're going to stop devoting disproportionate resources to these things right put the resources where things are working and then re like reassess basically come back when you experience business slumps do you get kind of like sad and emo about like is it a hard thing for you to go through or does it feel like calm for you it feels like failure to me yeah so you got to it's it's a mental game to me, I think, is keeping it fun. Right. Yeah. And like having things that you can go back to that get you back in the game and like give you the ego and the confidence again that you need. Yeah. I think you need to you need one of two things. OK, you either need delusion. Like, you are deluded that, like, you have a good idea and you're too naive to know that it's a long shot or. You need to be so confident and so have so much ego around what you're doing yeah. that you're like, obviously, this is going to work. Like, I definitely use music to, like, boost confidence for myself when I'm not mm. feeling it. Like, when I What's have a hard meeting coming up or I'm in kind of, like, a slump of, like, dang, like, things are just consistently not working, I definitely have some, like, go-to songs that just, like, pump me up there is a song on beyonce's homecoming live record it's like a remix in it's like an in between of the songs it's called i've been on have you heard this yeah, yeah it's yeah. like a chopped and screwed like it's i've like been on tune right it's like her voice but it's like it's her voice but it's like chopped and screwed down. like it's like a like almost like a dude's voice yeah, and yeah she's yeah. essentially just saying over and over again like i've been on i've been on tell me who's gonna take me off Ooh, and i, I like, like in it. the mirror like i kind of just like bulk myself <laughs> up i'm like say i like i'm looking at myself and i just like get <laughs> myself up and i'm ready for the meeting after that okay can i tell you mine <laughs> yeah yeah is it taylor swift <laughs> no you're not oh. gonna listen to taylor swift to get pumped up well, i don't know you gotta go for something a little more aggressive what i like new level by asap ferg I'm you know, on a new so, level. Yeah. I'm on a new level. He goes, that like little do 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 in the beginning. Yeah. And then he barks. <laughs> and I'm like fist pumping. Yeah, you got exactly. You can't not do that. That's, That's what you have to do when the song comes on. So it's a good way to like, I also like to do push ups to that song, but that's neither here nor there. I feel like also the it's fashion for girly. you is big definitely fashion the clothing you're like what is how do i feel today there's this video i love on youtube of rihanna accepting an award it's like a fashion award and she gets up to sort of do her speech and she's talking about how like life hasn't always been easy for her and how fashion is like a defense mechanism for her oh, in a lot of ways wow. and she has this line where she says like as a child i remember thinking you you can beat me but you can't beat my outfit Mm. <laughs> and like the way she says it was just like her like swag and her accent like you can beat me but you can't be my outfit like that gives me that confidence too that like i got an extra like armor on armor of, that's like, confident and cool about it. Yeah. if something goes wrong during the day like i got this i love I got that. something else so okay let's talk about pivots pivoting out of the slump right yeah. making that bold decisive action yeah I can think of a couple good examples of this. One is, I think one's kind of funny, but I'm going to tell you the the not very funny one first. So Sprint, you familiar with Sprint? Yes. Cell phone, phone right? Company, yeah. So in 2005, they had $29 billion in losses. And they get this new CEO in the door. Now, I don't know if you remember how annoying cell phone plans used to be. They were so expensive and you had to buy like each incremental thing. It would be like you're buying like a text plan and a data pl- data plans too were like ungodly expensive. And yeah. then you had like a number of like minutes. Remember like the AT&T rollover minutes? I definitely had my dad kick me off the family phone plan. He's like, you just can't have it anymore because I was just, you just going, kept going over. over my minutes and he was like well you just can't that is like an, i mean i feel like someone listening to that today who's like 22 would be like huh 
You had limits. limited you texts had limits? and calls. It sounds ridiculous. It does actually. sound ridiculous because yeah. it's that space has evolved so quickly. But at the time, that was very normal. It was so complex. You always felt like you were getting gouged by yeah. these companies. From and a just, business perspective, limiting usage of a piece of technology is not stupid. wild. So that's normal. But it feels weird now. Yeah, it's. I think it's stupid. Yeah. I'm like, it, anyway, so Dan Hess enters a CEO. Maybe it's Hesse. I don't know. And he comes in in 2007. He introduced is the radical simply everything campaign so he's a marketing guy that's oh. his background now normally ceos come from the finance background most ceos were like a com- controller or like in, a, in accounting or finance like they mm. understand the numbers because being a ceo is in of in a public company is so much about not saying the wrong thing <laughs> about yeah. your stock and like having wall street or like the sec come down on you yeah so you need an accurate accurate conservative thinker it is incredible incredibly yeah. incredibly hard and someone very well versed in finance this guy was a marketing guy who really cared about customer service so i think he saw this space as being like wait a second why is this so complicated and he introduces this plan that is basically you're paying a price and you get everything it automatically yeah. just simplifies everything cuts through all the noise and they turned it around they reversed the shrinking of the company which is so so hard to do yeah that is it so really hard. is it really is then they acquired virgin virgin mobile they entered the prepaid market i believe with that metro pcs and that's a totally different demo that they're going after there and then like most recently have merged with uh t-mobile but i think that that that's a great example of just being like it's almost that midwit meme where it's like just fix the problem that everyone hates and then all the complicated shits in the middle and then it's just fix the problem that everyone hates yeah like but you have the to obvious do, solution and the jedi solution are the same but you have to do something really different to get out of the slump radically what you're saying. change radical yes radically change, change. okay yep. this is the one that i just think is freaking hilarious so you know how in like recent years health food and wellness has become a very trendy topic yes so it's like all these salad chains all these businesses that are trying to promote how like yeah it's like health conscious customers okay well applebee's was trying to accommodate that trend yeah that's exactly the face i thought you were gonna make that is literally the worst thing you can do if your customers know you and love you for the opposite So Applebee's tries to get into this like calorie conscious health food train. They're like, hey, what if we got away from our core offering of degenerate comfort pasta and instead (laughs) tried this? Wait, stop, stop. Degenerate comfort pasta pasta you know that alfredo is making you sick that is exactly what applebee's is you get the guff for days you cannot think straight after you eat that alfredo i know it's true you're not wrong so they try to please this tiny contingent of people who by the way are not even eating at applebee's okay the people that are calorie conscious are not going to applebee's every (sighs) friday and is trying to, you know, appeal to them. And then they're getting totally squeezed by fast casual. Because if you want something that's, like, tasty and, like, kind of healthy, you're going to go to Chipotle or Cava or yeah. a place like that. You're not going to go to Applebee's. So they go, you know what? Fuck it. We're going to lean back into the basics. They introduce something called riblets. Okay? So I'm like, little rib. Like, yeah, Sounds just, good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> they introduce, this was the big one, the Dollarita. Okay, this is like a drunk suburban mom sensation. It's Um, a $1 margarita, the Dollarita. Delicious. Ever since 2020, they made this pivot back to like, no, we're going to stay true to who we are. Sales have been banging. Things have been great. Interesting. It's an interesting nuance. It's like a reverse pivot. It's a reverse pivot. And it's also an interesting nuance, too, because it's like you can be doing one thing, pivot, and if the pivot doesn't go well, you can just pivot back. Mm-hmm. Like sometimes we think the pivot is permanent. Oh, that's a good point. It's not Applebee's permanent. is a really great example of like take yourself back to the degenerate. Was it degenerate pasta? Degenerate comfort pasta. Degenerate <laughs> comfort pasta. <laughs> Just go back, go back to the de- degenerate comfort Just, pasta. It's like, retreat. Why do people like you? Yeah, retreat, 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 retreat. back to the pasta. Yeah. Climb back into the garlic bread. Get cozy. Get cozy in there. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it's it's that's a good point. It's that you're. You got yourself into a slump, maybe by trying to be something that you weren't. Ooh. And if it's not going well because you're just like a knockoff version of the original, then like, 
maybe uh maybe go back go retreat. back go back nothing wrong with that yeah this is good okay so i want to workshop this with you and for everyone who's listening to this and watching this so i want to kind of do a little activity around when it's time to pivot versus okay stay the course okay so i'm gonna give you some potential slump scenarios okay and you guys can play along with us if you go to youtube in the comments you can write your answer you can play along with us so we can see what it is that you think should be done in each of these scenarios if you should pivot or you should stay the course okay okay um scenario one by the way if you're playing with us on youtube tell us what number scenario you're putting your answer for so it doesn't get all jumbled up so scenario one after a year in business, your revenue is stable but hasn't increased. You Ooh. pivot, you stay the course. I'm going to say since you're just one year in, you stay the course. One year is still very, very early. Yeah. I would say the other side of that is like one year is so early that like it's easy. It's really easy to pivot one year in. Once you get like five years in, 10 years, in, it becomes harder and harder yeah. to like make yeah. these big pivots. So I'm excited to see what everybody says mm -hmm. on this, like if they would pivot or stay the course mm -hmm. on this. OK, Number scenario two. two, your marketing strategies are resulting in good engagement, but not conversions. So let's say maybe it's like social media marketing, you're posting, but not getting actual sales. Pivot. I think you got to pivot because the ostensibly the point of marketing is to be moving the needle for the business oh so i think you pivot Ooh, that's a good one a lot of people get caught up in like oh i'm doing marketing but like really long term it'll maybe congrats yeah you like know, the awareness play we don't have time for that it's we a startup. Have, unless you're really well unless you got endless marketing budget then okay yeah which most of us do not okay got it scenario three let's talk about ones that maybe you might see earlier on in your journey too. So you notice a gap in the market that your current business plan does not address, but could capitalize on. You pivot, you stay the course. I think pivot if you are still early on, you're still trying to figure out what you should be doing and you see the opportunity. I think then it totally makes sense to pivot. Mm -hmm. I think if it's a shiny new toy distraction and you're like, oh, that could be something, but like you already have something completely different and it's working, then I would say ignore it. Yeah, I also think a lot of times people can't get started in the first place because they keep pivoting their doggone business plan. Mm, okay. And so I think that's a scenario where like you have to look at yourself in the mirror and be like, I need to stay the course because every day, if you are finding a new thing, you need to add to it. You just need to keep doing it and keep yeah. doing it and keep perfecting the business plan. And, oh, I found a new opportunity. Also, do I you think... have a business plan? No. I, I don't have a business plan. Yeah. I think the business plan is like go on the Internet. LinkedIn, social media, whatever, find people who are good potential customers, send them a message and ask them to have a conversation with you if they would be interested in whatever it is that you got. That's the business plan, talking to customers, in my opinion. But great. You're like, if you have a business plan, pivot. <laughs> Just, we're done. That's the scenario. Pivot. Okay, got it. I'm curious to see what people say about this, too, because I do think there's value in thinking through your plan to some extent. Okay, so we're kind of talking about making these different moves in order to grow the business, to pivot, to grow, mm -hmm. to stay the course, to grow. But, like, is there anything wrong with just maintaining the business? Like, you get to a certain place. Can you just maintain it? Does, does it have to be the objective to grow? I don't think so. I think maintaining's fine. I think there are red flags, though, that you should look out for. So there's a couple that I think can signal that something is wrong. Now, mm. just flat revenue is not necessarily a bad sign, right? That could be okay, actually. But I think there are certain things that, that could signal you're, you're entering a slump or already in one. So if any of these things resonate, I would say that is a, a sign. The first is lack of clear purpose, <laughs> lack of clear goals beyond financial targets. A good way to test this is if you have teammates, if you were to ask everyone on the team what the purpose of the business is, are you going to get wildly different answers from everybody? Ooh, okay. That's Got a it. sign. Another is waning enthusiasm. Are you excited about the future? I don't think this can be underscored enough. If you are not feeling enthusiastic about what's happening, nobody is. Nobody is. No one's going to care more about it than you do. The third is disengagement from others. So, like in your organization, on your team, if you have teammates, like 
is the phrase, that's not my job, running rampant. People that are like, have a very narrow view of what they're there to do. And like, if you ask them to step in to fill a gap, it's like, well, that's not, that's not my job. Or if you're a solo founder or a founder yourself, are you doing that? Like, that's not my job is like creeping in. Because in reality, like so much of entrepreneurship is rolling up your sleeves and like doing stuff that's not Mm -hmm. your job. And so if you're finding yourself resistant to do stuff, that's a, that's an indicator something needs to shift. Yeah. And I think those are all kind of around mood vibe culture yeah. then there are some that are more about products so like lack of innovation is there any forward movement happening have you have you created something new recently or like is the last time that you tried something new way in the rear view mirror mm. that could be a sign that like stagnation is happening infrequent wins is it hard to think of something that you would be celebrating have you, is it, is it hard to be like, oh gosh, I don't know, we really haven't had a win in a while. I don't know. That yeah. could be a bad sign. This one, I think you see it more in larger organizations and it can be very frustrating, but I think when it starts to happen too early on a team, it's maybe a sign that something is going amiss. Process kind of trumping curiosity. So if you've ever been in an org that's really big, it's like, oh, well, we've always done it this way. Oh, well, this Uh, is just how we do this. Yes. When I worked at Microsoft, people said that all the time. Yes. Yeah. It's like, oh, well, we've always done it that way. That, you know, that is kind of a sign of complacency over being interested in finding novel solutions. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's hard to cultivate over time. But like, if you're seeing that, then I think it's a, it is a bit of a red flag. And then finally, just brand neglect. When is the last time that you like clearly articulated the position, the positioning, the messaging, the strategy, like are things feeling stale to you? Got it. And these are good signals to know if you are kind of getting stagnant and stale and maybe it points out to you the places where your business and plan is getting stagnant and stale. So maybe you don't have to like grow at all costs, Mm -hmm. be growing like crazy. You do need some sort of forward movement to keep you excited. Right. Some fresh energy. So I think there's a good example of this with the financial diet. Chelsea Fagan, their founder, was on How I Built This last year with Guy Raz. Hmm. And she told him growth is not our goal. We are perfectly content with between two and three million a year. We have 10 or 12 employees. We're happy with that. But in the absence of a revenue growth goal, this is me speaking now, something has to keep people motivated to, you know, hit the targets, right? There has to be something that you're trying to achieve. Maybe an impact goal or something. And usually money is what people are trying to achieve. People are motivated by financial targets. But if you don't have financial targets, something else has to fill that gap. Yeah. And she recently announced, I saw that they are revamping a lot of choices that they previously felt because they were playing it safe. And she's like, we need to inject some new life into the business. She, in so many words, was like, I'm kind of bored. Like, we've been doing it the same way for so long. I'm bored. I've been doing this for 10 years. So she said gross, not the goal. But we're kind of looking back at how that's impacted her, you're saying, and she's feeling bored. Yeah, I think it's Mm. like sometimes the wanting to always be these things, it's correlations. It's that if you're always trying to make more money, it might be like, okay, well, what other products can we launch? You're constantly trying to think of new ways to move the needle. And I think if you're like, oh, I'm happy with the money we're making, so we're just going to stay on the course we're on now. I think it's not about the money in either case. It's about the energy and the momentum that's that's behind and underneath those situations. This is also a really good example too, because sometimes we look at where a business is now, where a founder is now, yeah. and the founder is on a podcast saying like, oh, like we don't want to grow. We're not really trying to do that. But like you don't always get the full scope of how mm-hmm. that decision turns out for them later. Yeah. And so you take on that advice of like, oh, OK, like I'm going to be like that. But you don't sort of see how then later on they've got to correct for that. That's a really interesting nuance. Mm-hmm. OK, mm-hmm. so I'm hearing you say there's nothing wrong with maintaining, but you need something moving forward. What about like with quitting? Like we're talking about pivoting, but what about just like pure quit? I feel like quit needs a rebrand oh, a little bit. Okay. I think if you call, <laughs> I'm like, it's like when we call debt leverage. It's like, what if we just keep <laughs> calling quitting pivoting? Yeah. Interesting. This is good. My dad is retired now, but you can't say that he's retired. He's re- He will get very upset with you. He did not retire in his mind. He pivoted. He pivoted. He pivoted. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think making the decision to quit slash pivot, pivot, quit, 
Quivet. 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 To quivet is hard because you get these like conflicting accounts from other companies. You hear about companies like Airbnb that like struggled for a long time. Maxed and then out all the credit cards, in fact. Maxed it, took all the risk, yeah. and then finally hit it. Yeah. So you're just like hold, maybe holding on until your finally hit it moment. Yep. And then on the other side, you hear about founders that are like struggling for years. They let go of it. And the next thing is the thing that hits. And so it's kind of hard to make a decision about like what to do when you hear all of these different accounts. And then on top of that, there is this concept of like the fallacy of sunk costs, because yes. you feel like with sunk costs, you put all of this time into time, work, money, whatever it is, mm -hmm. into a project. And you don't want to tell everybody that, like, you're just starting everything new. Tell your friends and family, like, or admit that you're failing because you feel like you put so much into it that, like, you can't have that cost. Is that concept of sunk cost that you can't have the cost sunk? Yes, it's like if I give cost up failed. now, then that all those losses were for nothing. Yeah, the cost was sunk into the ocean and no, yeah. So that's another thing that makes it hard to make the consideration. And then on top of that, you have this deep understanding. I know for me, at least, when I come up with new ideas, I know that like my new ideas always seem way sexier than they are just because they're new. <laughs> You've like, got some novelty. <laughs> yeah, like I, like I know myself enough to know, like, it's like, oh, it'll be perfect. Everything's not, it's gonna go perfectly. And I realize after doing this multiple times and adding on new things or trying new pivots, even if it goes well, it's not as perfect as it was in my head when I made the original plan. So like when you're thinking about pivoting or stopping something, you're thinking about all of this in your head. There is a program that I did Oh, okay. Um, called Orbital Bootcamp. It was like my first entry point into learning about entrepreneurship. And this was like right when I was leaving Microsoft, I was doing this the, program. Is this the New York thing? In New York, exactly. Yep. It was in New York. And the syllabus for that program had a section because it was like a side project accelerator. The program was a side project accelerator. So to help you launch your side project. And there was a section in the syllabus about end of life care. Hmm. end of life care for startups and there was this article in there um by the ceo of yip it called when to throw in the towel as a founder okay and essentially what he's saying in the article is that, like you got to create a framework for yourself for when to know when to throw in the towel one you need a metric of success like pick one metric that you're trying to hit and then you need to say i'm going to give myself x number of iterations to hit that metric Okay. Right. So put a confined amount of time and a number of iterations on it. One, you have to iterate. Mm -hmm. You have to try some work at that. Yeah. And those are mini pivots. Right. Mm -hmm. Before you decide to pivot the whole thing to a whole new idea. Right. And then once you've done that many pivots, like it's time to move. And it could be like NPS, net promoter score is like one of the best things for this. So, so it's like brand affinity. Like how much do people like? Yeah. It's that question you see on a survey and it's like on a scale of one to ten. How likely are you to recommend good, this good, service, good, good. this yeah. business to someone else? And likelihood to recommend is a good indicator of like, are you making something valuable? Yes. Right. So it doesn't have to be NPS, though. It could be like number of site visitors or revenue. But you have to like create a metric and then give yourself a certain number of, like, tries at it. I know that I made the joke about how we need to rebrand quitting as pivoting, but I actually think I want to loop that to connect it back to what you said in the beginning about the, uh, the, the both sides of the narrative, right? Like, when you were switching from Collecto to Apps Without Code, yeah. it was like, ooh, one side of that coin is like, ooh, I failed, a Collecto failed. The other side of the coin is like, now I'm a two-time founder. Now I'm trying something different. Like, this is so cool and new and exciting. Yeah. I think the narrative that you are telling yourself about the path that you're on is extremely, extremely important because it's all in the framing of how you're thinking about these things. And yeah. you can actively choose to to skirt around the doom and gloom and and focus on the idea that like the benefits of what you're doing and how this is actually no, 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 this isn't me failing and quitting. This is me actually being a next level strategic thinker about the best path forward. A hundred percent, because I think there's a lot of benefits to quitting. Mm -hmm. There was a I just found this this like comic that was also in this syllabus. I just want to read it to you really okay. quickly. Um, because I think it, it says what you're saying right now about the benefit of quitting. So it says, here's something true. One day you'll be dead. Here's something false. You'll only live once. So it explains what it means. Mm. So it takes about seven years to master something. 
and there's like a chart with like years on it. So if you live to be 88, after age 11, you have 11 opportunities to be great at something, right? 11 opportunities, timestamps. These are your lifetimes. You can think of them as mini lifetimes. So most people never let themselves die to start the next lifetime. Oh, those 11 wow. pivots, right? And there's a little guy in the comic, and he says, I just, I've just, i always just known I was good at organizing spreadsheets. <laughs> He's not letting himself move on to the next life. And it says, some are afraid of death. I only trained in one thing. What if I'm not doing it? Who am I? Mm. Right? Instead of training into the next thing. Some think that they're already ghosts. I was good at basketball, but when I hurt my ankle, now I spend most of my time mentally thinking about like what didn't happen, what I didn't get to have. They're sort of living in the past life. But you have many lives. You know, and, and then there's a little guy, he's like, in two years, I, I'll die and I wonder what I'll get to do next. Mm -hmm. And so that's what this comic is about, about like, maybe we can link it for folks if they want to see like it. That. But this idea that you've got these 11 opportunities to be great at something and to really pivot intentionally to try different things over the years. I love that. And it also makes me think about how I look at my career up until this point and all the different little mini lifetimes I've already had. Woo! I had a moment yesterday when I was sitting in the office here at Morning Brew in New York and kind of having fun with all the people here and being like, wow, this is it feels like a totally different me, a totally different life from like Southwest and yes. Meta and like these other jobs I've had. It's like funny how these become these little insular chapters almost. Yeah, I'm thinking about this a lot right now for myself because I'm thinking about this. I can feel myself in a transition period mm. of being like a lot of my brand and things I'm working on being about like tech entrepreneur to now I'm getting really interested in media and reality yeah. TV and these things and sort of this next iteration of myself that I'm on. And to, to your point about finding the narrative I could say like oh like I'm worried people are gonna think I like failed at something and just quit something or I could sort of look at the other side of the narrative and all the things that I'm excited about about that new life stepping into so if you are in a position as a listener right now where you feel like you're kind of on that precipice or you're afraid to make the transition you're afraid to pivot I feel like this is Tara and I saying you have our blessing you have that permission to make the pivot if that's what you need to do. And it's not. We're, we're rebranding quitting. Go do it. Go pivot. Go pivot. And if you enjoyed this conversation, we have tons of other fun entrepreneurial conversations on our channel. So if you like this one, go ahead and check out some past episodes and we drop a new one every single week.